When I get to my end, then when I overextend myself, do I honestly believe that God is good enough to take care of me you know, as I become the person I want to become? Funny, you know, you hear this terminology, it is what it is consistently. <laughs> yeah. And I know it drives you crazy. Why is that? Uh, because it's not the shape of the heart of God. That's just not how God does things. God did not look at the world and say, yeah, that's fine. <laughs> God grabbed the world and made something. That's what yeah. he does. That's what God does. He creates constantly. And then when things go awry, God redeems. And then God forms. Like there's no point at which <laughs> like the shape of the heart of God is to say, eh, we're good. No, <laughs> The constant process of creation and renewal and rescue and redemption over and over and over again. So if I want to live well in the world, yeah. if I want to live well as a human being, if I want to live well as a person who is shaped into the likeness of God, uh -huh. I don't get to say it is what it is. Yeah. I get to say I have things that have been made available to me, circumstances, talents, gifts, strengths, weaknesses, and then I get to make a decision about what I do with what I have on hand. If I, don't look, if I want to look like God in the life I've been given by God, I don't get to say it is what it is. It's dangerous because it is ungodlike. Well, when you look at everything, you know, you have this, uh, this saying or this almost like battle cry that you, you provide language and shape through, through the process of life. Yes. You know, and this book does a lot of that already tangibly. How did yeah. you even discover that to begin with? Like, this is kind of like your calling you're walking in. Um, uh, trial and error, man. Uh, you and I have a really similar story in so far as like, you know, coming from circumstances that were not at all ideal and then watching the folks around us, like a few hero types, like you and I have a similar story in so far as like, there are folks in our lives that like, there aren't that many people who know this name, but yeah. that sister's a hero. That brother's a hero because yeah. I saw what you did with the little bit you had. Yeah. Um, and like it, it inspired me to recognize that regardless of what I've been handed, I have this choice to make about what I've got on hand. So the, you know, coming to, the, coming to the knowledge was, it was a matter of like, I'm going to try something. Mm -hmm. And, and then if I, if it does not work, I'm not worse off. <laughs> I'm not worse <laughs> off than I was before. Cause you can't get lower than that. Yeah, so yeah. It, it was honestly a matter of trial and error, which like, again, you and I resonate with this. It's like, that's the actual process and practice of faith. It's like, yeah. you don't get the assurance that's going to work out. What you get is the hope and the inspiration that you want to try and yeah. trust and then work it out on the backside. Now, do you find that, I mean, it, I can only speak from my own personal experience, uh, experience and, and, and obviously some of the audience that I'm, I'm very familiar with. Do you find it just, it takes time or some kind of catalyst in order to just have our hearts reopen to hope? Because, you know, when you've been yes. walking in a hopeless state for so long, it almost becomes like second nature to you and you're not, you don't even realize you're doing it. Yeah, it takes it takes time. Uh, it, it 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 takes a little bit of courage, it, and and this is the tough part, right? Is it actually usually takes someone else uh, coming alongside. Yeah. And so, like some of what I try to do with what I, with with this book or with anything I uh, anything else I do, like yeah, I want to encourage the folks who are down and out. I want to encourage the folks who like who are left with nothing, who've been broken mm -hmm. in half. Yeah. In all honesty, though, the folks I'm really after are the folks that have something to offer those people because you're yeah. actually kind of a linchpin. Yeah. If you don't offer as little as you think you had, so let's go. So this is in this is in the book too. Like, if you're one of the if you're this is Jesus, uh, the disciples come to Jesus and he and they're like, hey, all these cats are hungry and yeah. they've been following us around all day. And what Jesus doesn't say is like, yeah, it's a big old problem. I wouldn't imagine putting it on you guys because you know. That's a big yeah. problem. And I don't want you to feel responsible for it. What he does is say, yeah, there are like 5,000 hungry men here, which is like, so if you count women and children, like seven to 10,000 people, <laughs> he's like, so there are like seven to 10,000 hungry people here. What are you guys going to do about it? That, that's what Jesus says. And, yeah. and the disciples are like, um, what bro? Like, <laughs> only we legit quit manna, our maybe, jobs maybe to some manna? I don't know. Right. We like, we legit quit our jobs to follow you around the desert. But what Jesus says is, like, this is, this is actually on you and I will help you do it. Mm -hmm. So what, so give me what you have. And they figure out the little bit they have. And yeah. then they hand it to Jesus yeah. who says, thanks for it. And then does miraculously more than they could possibly imagine with it. Like yeah. there's this, there's this notion in which like, I want to speak to the folks who feel like you have, you don't have enough for the problems in front of you. Yeah. I would actually suggest that instead of believing that way, like that's mm -hmm. the world's informing you that yeah. like you don't have enough. Yeah. If you're looking at a problem in front of you, mm -hmm. especially if it's been in front of you for a long time 
it's possible, if not likely, that God put you there and not because you are enough, but because God is enough. And yeah. your faith is expressing you saying, I don't think I've got enough to do this, yeah. but I'm going to take the little I have. I'm going to try to feed 10,000 people with it and see what Jesus does on the other side of it. Yeah. I mean, it's funny. I think the um, when we look at the world, the market, especially the American culture specifically, there is an element of constantly being reminded from the from a marketing standpoint, you need this to make you happy. You need that to make you happy. You need this to feel secure. You need this to feel like you have self-worth, self-esteem and the comparison disaster that comes with it. I mean, I would argue or even debate uh, that, you know, in my time of just starting my first business, being able to look around you to see what's around you, because, you know, I started my first company with stuff literally out of the trash piles Yep, got me going, yep. you know, and then, you know, my, I think uh, in the scripture specifically, there's, there's a, I'm a, not word for word, but the way I look at it is if you're, if you're faithful with the little, you get made master over much. And that's been the story of my life. Yes. So when you decided to, to write, it, it, it's what you make of it. Or is that what you're kind of saying? You're just like, yeah. hey, your life is not nowhere near as bad as you think it is. In fact, you got tons of opportunity. Yeah. And, and in our context, like if God is good the way we believe God is good, mm -hmm. then your limitations yeah. are an invitation. The fact that you have an end, mm -hmm. like get, good, get to that end. Yeah. Like have freaking courage to get to the end of yourself so that grace can actually come in and mm -hmm. bridge the gap between what it is the desire of your heart the uh -huh. desire of god for your life and what you think you can do but yeah. you don't you don't actually get to experience that like the joy that you and i have mm -hmm. in looking around at where we're at and looking at like what has been accomplished yeah. actually comes from i know where my limit is i'm going to get myself there and when I get there, I'm actually going to I'm going to take that next step off the ledge into the nothingness that I think is there and trust that God's going to do a thing. I yeah. actually don't get to experience that until I get to my actual edge, mm -hmm. until I get to my actual limit and say, I know there's more here and I know that I can't get to it. So <laughs> you got to do a thing, Lord, yeah. in order for this to work the way it's supposed to. Like I get to have that joy because I got to my limit and then I pushed beyond it and let God pick up from there. That's exactly what I'm after. Is like, yeah, you don't. We, I want that full faith oriented yeah. life. I want that like glorious, like graces enough life. But man, most of us just don't live there. Most of us play it safe. I don't, I don't, most of us get to a point where like, I don't need grace and mercy because I'm taking care of mine because I've done all the math and I know where my limits are. I'm going to stop <laughs> until you and realize I, it can all be snaked away from you in a heartbeat. <laughs> and <to> exactly, yeah. <laughs> exactly, which I've done three times. So, yes. same, same. <laughs> yeah. You yes. know, when what, you, you've written so many other amazing books, why is this the message and why is this the, the time for the message to actually get out here? Uh, because of the moment we're in and you, you just got to it is um, for, so I coach a lot of artists and pastors. It's mm -hmm. what I do with most of my time now is I spend time. I was just before this call, I was a call with, uh, with two pastors and three artists mm -hmm. most of my morning. Sure. And everything for the most part, the folks have built some of these folks, some of these cats have been at it for like 15, 20 years. Mm -hmm. And as of March last year, everything was taken away, gone. Yeah. Like that. Yeah. I, I personally watched and, uh, and again, things, these are not conversations I have with everybody, but like, you know, this feeling like I yeah. personally, like between the beginning of March and the middle of March, it took you like all together about 10 or 12 days. I literally watched every dollar I knew for sure I was going to get mm -hmm. the entire year go away, gone. Yeah, it's gone. Evaporate. Yeah. Bye. It's gone. This, this moment we have that we're in, like this is like, it's not like there was the pandemic and there was a shutdown and now it's over and it's gone. No, no, no. This is going to last a minute. And some of the things we left, some of the things that we lost aren't coming back. So if you're yeah. a pastor, if you're a person who runs a church, there's a lot about what it looks like to run a church you're not going to get back. And I'm not saying like next year or the year after. No, no, brother, sister, it's gone. Yeah. It is gone, gone. And like the, what you cannot count on is the formula. What mm -hmm. you cannot count on is what was done 45 years ago when evangelical Christianity was ruling America. No, no, no. Yeah. What you can count on is Christ in you, mm -hmm. the hope of glory. If that is not your bet, if you're not yeah. placing all your chips on Christ in you, then you're actually going to miss over the next... 10, 15, 20 years. Mm -hmm. So this book is important now because so much about what we thought, so much about, uh, uh, so much about what, how we thought life was supposed to work just won't because it was taken away. It can be taken away and it will happen again. Bank yeah. on Christ in you 
or it will be taken away, period. Yeah. Well, when you look at the whole thing, you know, there's, uh, there's been a lot that's obviously happened over the last couple of years, but I was at a, um, I was at another event. I was listening to Sean Bowles speak for a few minutes and, and he was talking about um, somebody on his team had done a study and on the study, you know, one of the greatest arguments and against God's existence and his, um, you know, glory in front of us is the simple fact that we have world hunger. We've got world, this world, this world, this world, this Sean said they did, there was a study done and he, he obviously um, referenced the, 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 the uh, story that said there was enough wealth Yes. In the body of Christ, meaning yes. anyone who professes to be a Christian at any level, to solve yep. every single major yes. crisis that we say we Done. want. So we're meanwhile we're people going, God please, God please, God please, God please, and I feel like he's like, I did, I did, I gave I it did. to you. You're not being faithful to the little. Yeah, I gave it to you, and and you squirreled it away. And and it, there's a bit of a judgment here, and it's not my judgment. This is like like look, yeah. the judgment is wrought upon the lives of 15 year old kids who don't know where their next meal is coming from. That's where the judgment is. I'm not judging you. Yeah, I, I'm saying like the fact that there is world hunger, like that's not evidence yeah. that God is not good. That is evidence that we have not used well what we have been given. There is more than enough wealth in just the American church. Period. Mm-hmm. That the, and, and again, the stuff you and I know, the, yeah, average, yeah. the average church sees roughly somewhere between like two and 12% of their population, two and 12% mm-hmm. of the average congregation actually tithes. Yeah. Somewhere yeah. between two and 12%. So of, if there are a hundred people in your congregation and you're killing it, mm-hmm. 12 of that hundred people are actually tithing regularly. And yeah. of that 12 people, like half of them are only tithing between like five and 7%. Like mm-hmm. the numbers of people who are actually tithing up to 10% like are, is so incredibly, limited. like yeah. we're not actually doing with what we've been given, what God asked us to do when he gave Well, us. and I think part of that comes down to when, you know, there's an, there's an, all right. So I ran into a, a gentleman re- recently and we got into a conversation about God. He was an agnostic by nature. He's like, look, I, know, I believe there's something. I don't know what it is. You know, yes. I've looked at Allah, I've looked at Buddha, I've looked at Jesus, I've looked at all these, you know, all these different, you know, quote unquote paths as he referred to it. He said, the only reason I haven't leaned into Christianity, unfortunately, is because of Christians. Yep. And that really hurt my heart, you know, yep. but then I began to digest. I was like, okay, what, what is a Christian supposed to be? A Christian is supposed mm-hmm. to be someone who's been giving a, a gift, like the talent story in the Bible, who then scales what they've been given over and over and over again. And out of that comes yes. the abundance of the overflow that then solves the other needs. You know, and Jesus was very particular when he was with the Sadducees, or he actually was actually telling the story to the disciple about the Sadducees and the Pharisees going up to give yes. their tithe and all their yep. beautiful dressings and, and how the widow who gave all of what she had, which was very little, mites. exactly meant a whole lot more to God than God's heart. And yes. I think there's a lot we can learn from this, which is one of the reasons why I was so excited to see this book come out or I know it's coming out in June, but see it, see it come around because I think people have lost sight of the fact that they have a greater power within them than they're currently leveraging to use for like yes. any kind of like world commitment. Yes. So, yeah. so in, in other words, for, so the, 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 like the tail end of that for me is like my generosity has to be, has to be predicated on the goodness of God rather than the problem at hand. In other words, mm-hmm. like, is God good enough to do in my life, what would be required in order for me to live the way I want to, yeah. right? Like, I, do you want, this is the thing is like, like the thing we say about, the thing we hear about Christians, you and I hear the same thing. I like, I pastored a church for 20 years. Yeah, I live in Northern California. I hear a <laughs> whole lot about like what Christians aren't. And I, and I don't disagree with most of it. I'm like, I, I get it. Like I'm with yeah. these cats. I get it. So this whole, like, how do, do, but then I'm with my congregation. I'm like, do you want to be generous? Everyone wants to be generous. Do you want to be forgiving? Everyone wants to be, do you want to look like Jesus? Everyone wants to look like Jesus. Okay. The trick then isn't a matter of like, is, is the problem big enough for, to, to inspire me to do what is necessary? The trick is, do I honestly believe that God is good enough mm-hmm. that when I get to my end, that when I overextend myself, do I honestly believe that God is good enough to take care of me, you know, as I become the person I want to become? As I, like as I as I decide, like I actually want to live like Jesus. I want to love like Jesus. I want to give like Jesus. If I do that, the thing that keeps me from doing it is I'm afraid of what yeah. I will lose if I do. Rich young, you're older. Do I trust the goodness of God to mm-hmm. actually do something on the other side of that risk and of that faith? That's the actual risk. That's the actual problem. Yeah, I mean, it's the rich young ruler, right? Uh, come and you know, yes. sell off everything you own and, and give it to the poor and then come follow me. 
Well, I can't. I got too and, much. And, and, bro, and bro said, nah, I'm out. Yeah, I'm good. No, can't, turn I'm me good. You can keep it. I'm, I'm no, keep I'll, I'll bank. And what he said, and what he says in doing that is like, I will continue to bank on my own efforts. I'll, yeah. can, I'll continue to bank on my own math. Mm-hmm. And what he didn't bank on, what he didn't bank on was the desire that led him to yeah. Jesus in the first place. Yeah. That said, hey, I, I think you've got something else. And Jesus said, no, I do. But you've got to let go of this stuff in order to mm-hmm. get it. He's like, yeah, but I'm not gonna. Okay, then. You know, it's so interesting with, the, I mean, the COVID experience has been so hard on so many people, right? It's, it's affected everybody in some way, shape or form, yes. some at very, very difficult levels, including complete loss. Um, some at, you know, uh, financial strain, relational strain, all of a sudden you had happy marriages, all of a sudden became so a little more less happy because they're spending so much time together, all this kind of stuff, you know, but you know, one of the things that I used to hear about people that for tithing and giving is like, look, I'm tired of building buildings. I'm tired of doing this. Like, I want no one, no one's feeding the poor. No one's like doing this kind of thing. Yeah. And you know, with the COVID thing, and again, this might be a, a touch controversial. We don't have to like dig into it deep, but it seems like God actually took the very thing that we relied upon from us and said, now what? Now let's see what you can do. No, but homie, I buy that a hundred percent. Yeah. Like the stuff, like, like I love, I love the church, like mm-hmm. in the, in the, the capital T capital C sense. Yeah. I also really love local churches. Mm-hmm. And like, I'm a, like, you know, I, I, I'm a, I, I'm a West coast guy. Like I was born and raised, I didn't, wasn't raised a Christian. Mm-hmm. So the, like I came into the church with the note, like, how do you get to 500 some odd denominations? Like, I don't understand, but yeah. I, I haven't, I have not one time in the last 25 years that I've been doing what I do mm-hmm. traveling the country. I've been to every state. I've been to like 14 different countries. Like I have not been in a local congregation that I did not like love in some way like i love the church and i love churches i really do mm-hmm. <laughs> the 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 ball game ends up being mm-hmm. uh in those particular places among those particular people like are are we actually leaning into the character of christ as a, a as a collection mm-hmm. of people are we actually doing this in a way that looks and feels like jesus so the thing about like just as a simple example, and that, and I get it, like this is not everything, but it's, it's ten o'clock on a Sunday morning for ninety minutes, homie. That's cool. I'm glad that that worked f- from nineteen thirty some odd to whenever. Mm-hmm. But there's nothing in any of the scriptures, nowhere even close. Mm-hmm. It says like it's got to be ten o'clock or nine o'clock on a Sunday. Mm-hmm. Uh, and you've got to start with a song and then another song and then some announcements and that your preacher's got to preach for 35 minutes to 45 minutes. There's nothing in, there's nothing in the text about that. And God seems to have said, you're relying so heavily on the machinery you built. Mm-hmm. Let's find out what happens. Yeah. When you don't have that. And more to the point, if I take that away from you, when I take that away from you, will you trust, and we'll come all the way back to it, will mm-hmm. you trust Christ in you Mm-hmm. the hope of glory. I get it. Y'all had a million dollar budget. I totally understand how cool that was, mm-hmm. but that's nothing like trusting the spirit of Jesus in the lives of people mm-hmm. in relationship to other people. Yeah. We have to actually do the thing <laughs> that we've been talking about for all these years. If yeah. it, I, I, I'm with you hundred percent. I think it was taken away. I don't think God was like, here's a pandemic. Here's a like, but I think in the moment God was like, all right, I'm gonna, like, yeah. what's it look like for you to be you in me without all the stuff without all the stuff you think makes it possible yeah design no more designer shoes no more like I, you know it's funny i i have um i have a heart for people i always yeah. have i had my you know my own my own sacrifice and suffering moments and and gone through several crushings that have got me to this place and god willing i have a little more time before i have to go through another crushing i'm sure i'm sure i'm sure he's got more in store for me so he can keep, continue to, to work out his glory that being said, as we begin to look at this entire environment, how do we shift the mindset to the people directly to let them know it's what they make of it? Yeah, man. Um, as leaders, we confess our limitations and our failures. Mm-hmm. Like that's where we start, like, right? Like, that, like you and I both, like I began yeah. with a confession of my, the place I'm at. This is where I'm at. <laughs> I know where I'm at. Mm-hmm. I know, I, I know what I'm, I know where I'm starting from. We have to, we have to begin with a confession of, uh, of the place we are, mm-hmm. which is to say, we have to come to Jesus and we go back to the feeding of the 5,000. <laughs> the, 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 the literal come to Jesus moments. <laughs> the literal come to Jesus moment. It's, yeah. it, I mean, we, we're like actually in one. <laughs> like, yeah. this, is, this is an actual, we actually act, we have to actually come to Jesus and say, Hey, 
this is what we thought we were doing missionally. This is what we thought we thought we were doing institutionally. Mm -hmm. And what we really have on us is we have like a few loaves and a little bit of fish. And we're looking at the mission and we're looking about the few and we're looking and like, we have to confess, I do not have on hand enough to do what I had planned on doing. I, I know that I don't. I don't have enough for what's in front of me. And I have to bring that to Jesus. Um, it, and <laughs> that's the first step. The second step is actually lean into the, 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 the frustration and the sadness that comes with that. Mm -hmm. It's like uh, all the self-help, whatever stuff in the world, like, like you know, homie, you're not enough. You're actually yeah. not. Yeah. And if you believe that you are with all your training, like you're going to miss the moment. You're, mm -hmm. This isn't a matter of like just what you have on hand because you don't have enough on hand. You also are not enough. You're just mm -hmm. not. So confess that you don't have enough. Confess that you are not enough. And then lean into the actual story that you've been preaching or believing all the way up till now and decide that this is actually going to be true. Mm -hmm. So a story, um, this is like, this is actually in the book. This is from a couple of years ago. Um, we, we, the place I'm living in now, we moved here and I, I, I jog a bunch and I found uh, not too far from here. There's this park. It's a cool park, but the, my favorite part of the, of the area is like this, this is the space between uh, the parks where there's like a, a series of trails. And yeah. when it rains, talk about a metaphor, when it rains and the water rises, mm -hmm. there's a place on the trail that you cannot, well, I cannot cross because I'm, I'm five, six and Scotch Irish. And I, and, uh, <laughs> I'm five, five. I got you. <laughs> there you go. So I would come to that point in the trail and either I would have to decide that I'm just going to get my feet super wet and sloggy and gross, or I would just turn around and head home because the river was too high or the, the water was too high. Mm -hmm. So this particular day I'm jogging along and I come upon this part in the trail where the water is too high because it's rained and mm -hmm. somebody had built a bridge. Mm -hmm. like, and this is like a mile into the park. This isn't like right off the road. This is like a mile in and it's like a bridge bridge. It's like seven or eight feet across. It's a nice arch. I was like, mm -hmm. whoa, this is like a bridge bridge. Yeah. So I run home and tell my wife all about it. We go out three or four days later, it's gone. And she's like, I thought you said there was a bridge here. I'm like, no, I promise you there was a bridge here. <laughs> and as we're looking around, mm -hmm. uh, there are shards and pieces. Like, like someone else had come along and destroyed this thing. They had ruined it, torn it to shreds. And it's all over the place. There's wood with nails in it. It's all over the place. And I'm like, sad. And then that's that, that's that yeah. it is it like it is what it is moment, right? Like mm -hmm. devastation comes along. Things get destroyed. This is the pandemic. Things come along and take away what we built. So maybe a week or so later, it's rained again. I'm jogging along. I come to that point. I'm expecting that I'm going to have to turn, you know, turn around and go home. Mm -hmm. And there's another bridge. Yeah. Whoever had built the first bridge came back and built the second bridge. <laughs> and they didn't just build it like new. They actually took pieces because I could see like it's wood from the old bridge that they had like reassembled yeah. into the same, into this new bridge. Yeah. And I was like, that's awesome. That's amazing. Mm -hmm. And you would think that's, that's like a good enough place to stop the story. But the reality is, is like three days later, mm -hmm. someone, I, I came back and the bridge was gone again, another time. It's gone. Jeez. And I look up the, I look up the Creek and because this one is built the way it was built, this person, cause, cause they couldn't tear it apart. They dragged it up the Creek mm -hmm. and like, and dropped it like 400 feet up. So as I'm standing there, Looking at my, my situation, what I recognize is this. <laughs> I've been bearing witness. This is actually the, like the actual prophetic moment of this conversation. I've been bearing witness to, I've been telling stories about this, this um, battle between mm -hmm. good and evil yeah. for a really long time. But I had actually no real stake in the game. I only had benefit. I, I would only benefit from someone else doing something about it. Mm -hmm. And now I had a choice because that bridge was 400 feet up the creek. Yeah. So the choice was, am I actually going to get myself dirty, get involved here? Am I actually going to take a risk and get into the mud and the slog? Am I going to put my time and energy and my muscles into this thing or not? And the answer as a Christian is like, yeah, bro, like, here's your shot. You don't get to just mm -hmm. hear stories of kids starving to death. You don't just get to hear stories about people who don't know the Lord. You don't get to just hear the stories and entertain what it looks like for the world to go back and forth. No, no, no. It's time for you to get in neck deep. And so I hiked myself up and I grabbed this bridge. It took me like 45 minutes or so to like <laughs> drag 
bring it back to where it was yeah. and prop it up right. But like the the decision I make then is to is to enter into this story and say like here's here's what I've got. I don't know how to build a bridge. I don't I don't I don't know how to I don't know how to fix a broken bridge. What I have is I have the t- I do have the time, the energy, and I have the investment. So I'm going to take what I've got on hand. Yeah. I'm going to take the opportunity I've got. I'm going to get all the way into this thing and involve myself. And I'm going to prop this bridge up as best I can. And I was out there. Th- that was two years ago. I was out there four days ago. That thing is still there. There you go. That's that awesome. new bridge is still there. Yeah, that's a beautiful story. No, I like it. You know, it, it reminds me a lot of why I started doing this. You know, I um. I began putting myself in the public eye probably technically five years ago, but really over the last year, but I've actually decided, yes. okay, I'm going to put myself out there and I'm going to help as many possible people as I possibly can. And before yeah. I leave this earth, essentially. And you know, the, the, if, if for any of those, any of the folks that obviously watch the show on a regular basis, they know at the very beginning of the show, there's a bridge that then turns into an icon that makes up, you know, essentially the logo that's associated with my name. What most people don't know is that bridge has multiple meanings. The first meaning mm. is, is the simple fact that I almost threw myself from a bridge at my lowest moment. Mm. Literally, I was staring at the moment from looking at a life that was going to be lost versus to a life that could be. And, I, yeah. and I, so, I, so I identify with that. Secondly, yeah. there was a situation where I had a, a very, very, very um, colorful dream. So I dream a lot. And a lot of my dreams come true either in full uh, meaning the literal and or figurative and, and you just almost know, oh, that's what that meant kind of thing, yep. right? So that's kind of my life. Well, I had a dream yep. and I was, in, um, I was in Ireland, matter of fact, over there by the spire and there's a bridge there called the Haypenny Bridge. It's a very mm-hmm. specific bridge. Everybody knows where it's at. Yep. And in this dream, I had rebuilt the Haypenny Bridge out of books, resources, all kinds of videos and all kinds of stuff. And I'm working as feverishly hard as I possibly can. On one side of the bridge is like what I would refer to as the faith community or the community of, you know, people that are believers, maybe on various levels of their journey and stuff like that. And on the other side of the bridge was a very, very dark space. And then I got to the top of the bridge in the dream and I just began looking to the left and looking to the right and waving people as quickly as I could up onto the bridge, kind of like this kind of scenario. And what I began to realize is I've been given a gift of not just stewarding certain levels of income, but more importantly, stewarding certain levels of information. That yep. helped me begin to understand that there was a resource that I hadn't yet tapped into. So I began to say, I, I, I was telling, even telling my book agent recently, I said, I feel like one of the reasons I've never really fit in the faith community and I've never really fit in the quote unquote secular community is because I'm not supposed to. I'm yep. supposed to be a conduit, That's right? That. So as, a, so as a result, so I dug into that. And then the third part of the bridge piece was I realized the information that we were doing literally takes people from where they are to ultimately where they want to go. And it, it all happens through being faith with the little things, which is why I think your books are pivotal. That's it. There was a, I mean, talking about books, uh, you know, I was on Young Life staff from 1993 to 1998. Mm-hmm. And in order to, and part of our training was we read a book, uh, and I just looked it up so I got the name right. Uh, Rebecca Pip, uh, Pipper, I think it's Pippert or Pippert. Mm-hmm. I don't really know. Pippert. Uh, she wrote a book called "Out of the Salt Shaker and Into the World," mm. and the whole notion was, you know, you know, Jesus talks about like you are the, you know, you're, you're the light of the world, and he says you're the salt of the world. Yeah. There's a whole thing about physics and light, but the, <laughs> but the her bit was like the main thing was about being salt, mm-hmm. and uh, and that you you are actually shaken out. I'm going to say it again. You're actually shaken out mm-hmm. into the world to make the world, uh, you know, in, the, in your analogy, on the other side of that bridge. Like yeah. you live over here. Yeah. You are shaken out yeah. into the world that exists in order to enrich, in order to make it more flavorful, in order mm-hmm. to soften. That's, that's, your, that's your thing. And, uh, you know, you, again, <laughs> the things I really like about you and why I wanted the conversations about is because like, I got shook out. Like I, I've yeah. been shook out a bunch. Like there, there's a lot about how I ended up where I am that like had, like, I didn't, I didn't want to do that. I, I did mm-hmm. not want that. I didn't yeah. want to go there. I didn't want to experience that. I had no interest. <laughs> I would not have planned that. So much similarities. <laughs> but homie, like I, I, I hated it while it was happening. It was like, honest to goodness, like legit pain. Like I'm mm-hmm. in pain. I still have sadness about it. Like it's awful, but I wouldn't be where I was without it. 
Yeah. As a collective body. And this is, again, here's the moment we're in. This is like why I, like, I wanted this book out now. Yeah. As a collective body. Y'all, we got shook out. This is mm-hmm. what's happening. Yeah. We got shook yeah. out. Let's be you real. Can either cling, you can either cling to the salt shaker mm-hmm. and, and try to stay in the safe environment you've been living in, or you mm-hmm. can go where God is trying to send you yeah. through all the trial and all the pain he's trying it this this moment for the next like several months to several years it's gonna be hard you're mm-hmm. gonna lose stuff that you thought you needed mm-hmm. and if you if you hold on to it then you will miss out on the blessing on the other side of it yep. but if you let go and you deal with what you have to if you deal with the if you endure if you do the the, the, the long suffering part Mm-hmm. That, that Paul talks about, but yeah. what it looks like to be a Christian. It's faithfulness, it's love. It's also long suffering. If you do that part, yeah. then you will end up on the other side of that bridge and you will be where Christ wants you to be. Yeah. Y'all, we got shook out. We mm-hmm. actually got shook out of the salt shaker. And now we get to actually be the blessing we're supposed to be in the world. Are you willing to do that? Are you willing to take what you've got on hand yeah. and bring it to Jesus and say, I'm not enough. I don't have enough. Do something with me. Yeah, I mean, if you think about it, what if, if we really want to look and feel like Jesus and, and go and literally have Christ within us on a regular basis, Christ never owned a building. Nope. He walked for miles, went to yep. places he wasn't supposed to, you know, in theory wasn't supposed to be or go to. Yep. And poured out yep. love to the people that, quote unquote, the religious side of the world said they're yep. worthless, don't bother. Yep. Which is the very first person he went to. And then the person he only got, the, the people group he only got agitated with were people who were so focused on tradition and man-made rules and, and, and circumstances that yep. it prevented other people from finding faith to begin with when God's heart yep. was to create faith. Well, that's what the, th- I mean, so that, I mean, so what the, <laughs> it's like, actually what the Pharisees and the Sadducees were doing was like, Jesus was turning the salt shaker upside down saying, hey, I'm not saying you're a bat. This is not bad. Yeah. I'm just saying we're done with this season. We're done. Mm-hmm. Like, this is good. You've been faithful. I'm turning this upside down. I'm turning yeah. upside down and I'm shaking you out into what's next. And they were like, nope. <laughs> like, like yeah. reach out and grab someone like, no, we can't. And we're yeah. going to kill you instead. That's what they decided to do. They're going to clutch onto the thing. They're going to clutch onto the salt shaker. Mm-hmm. This is one of those moments, man. This is and- like, Jesus is turning the thing up. He's actually turning the thing upside down. You don't yeah. get to have it anymore because I've got something next for you. Do you want what I have for you or do you not? Yeah. And, you know, the, the image that keeps popping in my head is uh, Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane and, and, you know, they come in to arrest Jesus and, and Peter slicing off an ear. That's him clinging to the salt shaker. Right. Yes, yes, and then if, if you think about it, as that happens, there was, yes, there was a three day dark window where everything when all hope looked lost. Yep. And then one of the most beautiful things in history happened mm. that gave us the alternate. Right. Which is yep. the ultimate piece of salvation through a resurrection. Come on. You know, so if I was I just that was the things that pop in my head. Yep. Jesus told them, "Hey, you guys are done with the season. I'm going to the cross. Yep. I'm going." Well, no, yep. Lord, you can't do that. You got to, you got to save us. Like we need, we need a king. Yep. Because it's got to look like this. Yeah. Because that's what we know. Exactly. And that's exactly. how it used to work. And he said, and he's no, like, no, nah, it doesn't work. Let, that way. let go of it. Let let go of it. Trust suffer me. for a minute. Just suffer for a minute, mm-hmm. and trust that I have something better that you can. Po- no one saw. No one believed, no one actually trusted that the resurrection would actually happen. It's all kinds of philosophical notions, all kinds of poetry. No one actually believed that there was an actual person who yeah. died and then came back. No one believed it. That's the yeah. thing. It's like no one actually believed it in the moment. No one did. Mm-hmm. Not the disciples, none of the folks who taught it before. No they didn't one believe it was possible. Believed. No, they didn't believe it was possible. And Jesus yeah. said, hold up. Here's the deal. I'm going to die. I'm going to die suffer for a minute just suffer for a minute i'm telling you if you do and you trust what i'm saying then on the other side of your suffering is more than you can possibly imagine happening Mm -hmm. and this is the moment we are in right now you could not begin to possibly imagine what god has in store Mm -hmm. in the next season of life for the people of christ not for the church as we know it not for your church as you know it, but for the people of Christ. You could not begin to imagine. Yeah. Are you willing to take the moment you have on hand, wait, and then bring to Jesus what you've got and say, what can you do with this? And then yeah. watch him do more than you can possibly imagine. That's, yeah. This is the moment we're in. Yeah, I mean, a couple of things come to mind. And the first thing that comes to mind is uh, something that I told my grandfather right before he passed away, who ended up leading me and loving me to faith, not through condemnation and conviction and guilt and shame, but through 
you just need to dig a little deeper and I love you keep going kind of scenario. Yep. And, you know, he told me a long time ago that he just wanted to get to the place where he could lay crowns at Jesus's feet. And I got to thinking about that even, even recently. It's like, Lord, let my life be so impactful that every yep. single thing I do, it's a crown that I can just give to you. Yep. I could just lay at your feet and yep. just be done. You know, so that's the first thing. That's the first massive takeaway that I think that that really kind of resonates with me. The second thing is, is, you know, through all the trial and tribulation, my life has taught me that every time I think things are done and hopeless, within a short amount of time, things get miraculously better. In a, in a, and I'm yes. different. You know, I went through a pretty, yes. uh, pretty large embezzlement thing not even three years ago, and it changed me radically. It's part yeah. of the reason why. It's funny because before the embezzlement thing, I wanted this, I wanted, craved, and sought the stage and everything that came with it. Yep. Literally during that season, I'm like, you can have it. If this yep. is what it costs, I don't, I don't want anything to do with it. And it was yep. almost like he waited to that moment to say, okay, now you're ready for it. Yep. You know? So I, yeah. I, I think this is such a pivotal, uh, pivotal conversation, and, and, and people need to hear it because I think people have been lost in the wilderness for a tremendous amount yes. of time. Because they had been led astray in a lot of different ways. And they don't understand what the crowns are. In other words, so like in, in the story you're telling, like mm -hmm. the crown is not your success. The crown is like the crown you lay at the altar is mm -hmm. like, this is what I thought glory was. In other words, mm -hmm. like being on the stage, being the celeb, being the powerful mm -hmm. speaker person, this is the crown you lay at the altar of Christ. Like the, the moment you said you can have that is yeah. the moment you actually laid that crown down. Mm -hmm. That's the part that we don't actually get. What we believe is, my crown, the thing I'm laying at the altar of Christ is my success, that I get to a place where I've got, I've, I've won, I've accomplished, I've succeeded. Now I get to give, give to Jesus my successes. <laughs> and he's like, no, homie, like what I'm trying to say is like the thing you think is glorious, I want you to hand it to me because mm -hmm. I'm going to take it away. <laughs> yeah, I want to take it away from you because I have way better stuff than this crown. You think that's a crown. I get it. I understand. You think that's a crown because they told you that it's not. I, I, I'll take that and mm -hmm. I'm going to do other stuff with it. Like the moment you decided, like, I don't want the stage. I don't want the fame. I don't want the stuff. Like you hand it, that, that's you laying that crown down. Mm -hmm. This is the stuff we lose. This is the yeah. stuff we don't quite get culturally yet is yeah. like our successes, our numbers, the numbers of people like used to come to faith Sunday or like the number of baptisms and all these things the way we would measure like the, the church attendance and butts mm -hmm. in seats like these are our crowns and we thought that we needed greater success and he's like I, I want you to hand that to me because I have way better than that mm -hmm. and you need to trust me for that yeah I mean if you think about it you know a couple of things you, you know Jesus first said um, I go to prepare I go to prepare a place for you if it were not so I would have told you mm. Come on now. Right. So he, yep. he so he says that. And you and then if you go back to Peter's example, he goes through the ultimate moment of desperation, isolation, and loneliness, and loses himself and what he thinks he lost with the denial. Jesus not only restores that, but then baptizes yep. the entire group weeks yep. later with the Holy yep. Spirit. And those 12 dudes radically altered the entire course of the entire world. Yes. Yeah, and no, and none of them counted on it. And this is the thing: is like, like, <clears throat> we, you know, we, uh, well, not we, like, but oftentimes folks will talk about the, like the doubt of Thomas or the faults of Peter or his overzealousness. Um, and like, I love those stories because they they get like I've got room for myself in those stories because mm -hmm. I'm hurt, I got I'm I've, I'm riddled with doubt at times yeah. and I'm overzealous at other times. And so like I see Thomas and I see Peter, I'm like, there's room for me in these stories. Yeah. The other side of the coin is like what 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 Thomas had was his was his critical thinking and he brought it fully to the table. So when Jesus like like legit like walks through a locked door. <laughs> like <Yeah. laughs> this is such a great moment. He like the door is locked, they are hidden. Jesus walks through a locked door, like comes through a wall mm -hmm. and Thomas is like, "Yeah, I don't even know if this is real." Like, "Bro." <laughs> like, "What?" Yeah. And what Jesus does is he takes what he takes the best of what Thomas had to offer, which was he's a little bit duplicitous. He's a little bit like he's a little bit doubtful. And, and Jesus is like, hey, you know what? I actually like who you are. I like who you are critically. So I'm yeah. going to give your criticalness a moment. And he gives him a moment. It's in the scriptures forever mm -hmm. and ever and ever. And yeah. he takes what Thomas brings to the table, what Thomas has on hand, and he makes a beautiful moment out of it. 
similarly with like with uh, with Peter's zealousness that mm -hmm. like he takes Peter's zealousness and then he and then after the resurrection he brings him to the beach and he's like let's talk about where we <laughs> let's talk about where yeah. you, you really want this is Peter and Peter's like Lord you know I love you and he's like okay do you really want this mm -hmm. and Peter's like no you know I love you and Jesus is like do you really want this and Peter's like, no, you really know, I, you know, I really love you. He takes Peter's zealousness and does something beautiful with it. Like the, yeah. even in those moments, Jesus takes the best of what these people ha have on hand, which is mm -hmm. not enough and still says, I will make something beautiful with it. Can you believe, can you possibly believe they can take what you, you have on hand Yeah. and Jesus could make something great with it? This is well, why Jesus, the Jesus is so beautiful and powerful. And if you even tie it back to the loaves and the fish, not only did he take what was beautiful about each individual and do something with it powerful, he also took what was broken with each individual and did something powerful. Yes, yes he did. Mankind can't do that. No. We're, 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 we get lost too much in our selfishness of self-seeking. Even when we, even, and I, and I dare say as much as we want to give, there's always an element of humanity that says, well, I'm giving because I know if I give today, it's going to come back to me. Yep. So the expectation itself kills the heart of yep. the gift. It does. Well, and, and again, like the difference between giving the way we understand it and giving the way Christ is asking us to is when we go back to like, what, what are your actual next steps? Can I first and foremost, again, confess, I do not have enough. This is not enough. Yeah. Can I confess that I am not enough? Mm -hmm. Now I'm an actual, now I'm actually in a posture to give a divine natured gift. Yeah to say, I don't have enough and I'm not enough. I'm gonna give it to you anyways and trust and believe that you are enough. Mm -hmm. And because you are enough, I can give you everything I've got and you'll do, some, and you'll do something glorious with it. Yeah. It, it doesn't work the same way. It doesn't work like, well, I've, I've accumulated this mm -hmm. because this is this way. And I know the math from here, if I do this, this will happen. Homie, that's not faith. It's mm -hmm. not faith. It's not faith to say like, this is, this is, this is, this is what I've got. I know the math. And if I do this, then here's my results. That's not faith. Faith is, I know that this is not enough. I actually know it. I feel it. And I've got a little bit of shame and fear involved in the mm -hmm. offering of it, but I'm going to hand it to you anyways, and believe that you can actually do more with this than I can possibly imagine. And then I'm just going to wait for the three days between you dying and being raised. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm going to do. That's actual faith, which mm -hmm. is the moment we're in. No one, and you and I both know this, no one knows for sure, no one knows what it's going to look like for to, to be a, a church or to do church mm -hmm. 10 years from now. Literally no one. Yeah. And, if you, and if you're telling people you do, you're lying. You actually don't. You have mm -hmm. no idea. 60% of people in the area I live in are not returning to the churches they were in a year, a year ago when the pandemic started. No one saw that coming. Mm. No one saw that coming. 60%, and that's just this area. I talked to so folks in Pennsylvania, mm -hmm. in Lancaster County, it's 75%. 75% of people who left their churches, who like couldn't go to church at the beginning of the pandemic, are not returning to the same churches. They're going to different churches. Yeah. You don't know what it looks like to do church 10 years from now. You have no idea. Yeah. Can you take what you have on hand mm -hmm. and bring it to Jesus and say, please do something with it because it matters more to you? Mm -hmm. mm. That's good. That almost got me, man. <laughs> I'm, I'm thinking about, you know, I just, I'll be candid with you real fast. I don't care who's watching. Um, we're having such a good conversation. Yes, sir. Um, I've got a, I've got a, a pretty massive live event um, that has been in the making for those five years. Yep. It just, but it just so happens, you know, we've, we've done really well this year in, in serving people and helping people. And as, yeah. as a result, they, they want more service and things of that nature. And I can tell you right now, you know, I've got quite a bit of money invested in the event, quite a bit of money invested in the live event center. Mm -hmm. I've thought through the experience. I've thought through the, the uh, speakers I've, that I've invited over to speak on the stage and, you know, are they sincere? Do they really want to help people or is it fame? Is it fortune? Is it, what is it? And through all of that, this will be the largest single-handed undertaking I've done in this short amount of time yep. prior to that. And honestly, there's nothing else I can do. Yep. There's nothing else I can do at this stage in the game to ensure success other than to say, Lord, it's yours anyway. Take it. I mean, it, it was funny, you know, when I went out through that crazy experience with the embezzlement thing, um, I was actually stepping on stage the night before, like I learned about it the night before, 
step on stage, taught for three days straight for at the live event. So I was completely broken and shattered while I'm teaching, <laughs> um, which was a hot mess. I mean, seriously, I was a wreck. Um, it did. I mean, yes. Yeah, I mean, it 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 did force me to actually ask: Am what I t- is what I'm teaching authentic, and will it work? There still was a piece of that. Yes. But secretly in my prayer closet, I was like, God, I don't understand. Why would you have me spend three years? I mean, three years building content frameworks and, and like yep. making it super simple to digest. Why would you have me do that? I don't understand. Yeah. And I kid you not, not a single urging dream voice, nothing from God for whatsoever for almost nine months, nothing. No. I went from praying on my knees to praying on my face. And one thing I learned from my grandfather is when you feel like you need to run from God, that's when you need to run to God. So I just kept tugging on the shirt tail. I'm like, no, I'm still here. I'm still here. Right. And out of the blue, about nine months later, I'm sitting at my office and I'm working on an Excel spreadsheet for my construction company, totally giving up on the dream of service and all the prophetic words that have been poured over my life and everything like that. This is what I hear. I never said you weren't going to use it, but you're not going to use it for your glory. You're going to use it for mine. Come on, man. That was it. That's it. Six months later, through a set of divine inter, uh, interventions that I can't only explain through God moving sh- puzzle pieces. Yep. It put me back in not just a track to build something special, but a track to fast track it. Like I, this thing's got a momentum yes. that is be well beyond me. Yep. Like well beyond what I can do. You know what I'm saying? And each day I had a friend of mine, Ira Davis, Ira Jeemed Ira Davis. He's out of, he's actually out of Cali too. Love the guy. Text me out of the blue. Yeah. He said, tr- he just said, it just says, trust God, bro. Trust God. I'm like, all right. So the theme of the day, especially now talking to you is trust God, bro. Yeah, it is. Trust God, bro. That's Love it. it. Bring what you have, hand it over. Uh, again, like it is, it is, it is what you make of it. Like paying attention to what we have on hand. Like what do you actually have on hand? Mm-hmm. Do everything you possibly can with what you have on hand. Mm-hmm. And at the point at which you actually get to your end, Mm-hmm. that's when like the the deeper glorious like life transformational world transformational faith journey actually begins yeah that and you and i both know man most most of us just don't live there most yeah. days what's scary yeah it is scary it's scary it's scary to confess it's 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 scary to, to actually take account of what i've got it's scary mm-hmm. to actually try your best because you're afraid of failing mm-hmm. and it is scariest most to come to your end and actually believe that God's going to do something bigger, better, stronger, deeper than mm-hmm. you had imagined. When you think about your ultimate outcome, what is your, what is your ultimate goal or outcome you would like to see for this book as readers? Read? I want to see folks who, um, yeah, I got a couple answers to that. Uh, in, in the broad sense, I want to see folks who don't think they have something to offer, start offering what they have. Mm. Yeah, that's good. So that's that's a little. It's, I want to see like if you feel like you don't have something to offer, I hope you read the book and you start offering what you have. Yeah, uh, you're one of the twelve disciples looking at ten thousand people and be like, I don't, I don't have enough of this. And Jesus is saying, How about we just make something with what you got? Yeah, you got to fish and grab it. I'm not, I'm not asking you to feed ten thousand people. I'm asking you to trust me. Yeah. Uh, and the other part of it is, and this is a little more hyper specific, is um, I'm really believing that the next phase, the next season of what it looks like for people to live uh, live out faith is smaller. Mm-hmm. It's more um, it's more relational mm-hmm. that I actually know know the people I'm living my faith life with. Mm-hmm. Um, it's more it's far more local mm-hmm. uh, because life got smaller. Mm-hmm. Um, that's a really, really specific piece that like i feel like i think i'm hearing and i'm just trusting <laughs> like there's i'm just doing what a, i'm supposed to do there's coming a time when even in this country that church service will be inside of houses again as it started I, this is that this is the thing man this is what i'm saying it's like it's 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 that like we had a minute and it was cool it's great and i think we did really i honest i'm not one of those cats that's like oh the big churches and all this garbage. no 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 i think we did really well with what we were given for the time mm-hmm. and i think it's over and I think there will be some folks who do that for a while, mm-hmm. and that's great. That's fine. But if you're listening right now, <laughs> the yeah. chances are, bro, that's not you. Yeah. Uh, and that doesn't mean you have to wait for the pastor who can who can harness fifteen thousand people on a Sunday. 
mm-hmm. because there are 120 people in your neighborhood who just don't want to go to that church, but they'll come to your house yeah. and like and have share a life with you. and and just talk about life and let you pray for them. Mm-hmm. And bro, if you don't do that, I'm sorry, then it's just not going to happen. So it's yeah. kind of on you yeah. to do the thing that you have to do. Yeah. I mean, if you look at everything that, you know, made Jesus, Jesus is he was hyper relational, yes. hyper intentional and hyper focused on the mission that he had at hand. Yes. Whatever was right in front. Mm-hmm. He stops in the middle of that road, man. He's on the yeah. way to the big, the, the big dog's house. He's on the way to Jairus's house and everyone's like super excited. He's going to Jairus's house because mm-hmm. Jairus is like big, you know, big kid, religious cat. Mm-hmm. And like some woman, no one knows touches him and jesus is like this is what's happening right now and everyone freaks out <laughs> they're like bro we gotta be somewhere yeah. we gotta be in a, we have to be somewhere important he's like i'm right here right now and this with is this person and i will do this until i'm done so yeah. y'all can wait and then write a story about it yeah i don't know if you know dallas jenkins at all or, or you know the, the the creator of the chosen um tv program that they put on youtube but it's a, it's amazing um cool i'll check it out yeah it's like super amazing it, it's it's taught from a different perspective it's taught from the relational yeah. side of Jesus and the disciples. That's and it, cool. Yeah, it is super freaking awesome. Um, okay. Yeah, they just did one recently where they were telling the backstory of the um, man by the pool of Bethesda. Yeah. Right? So check this John out. Five. Yeah. So, you know, they're, so they're doing that. So they're doing the story, but they actually carry that guy's back, his origin story, all the way back to birth, where how he actually mm. got his legs damaged and all the suffering he went through all the way, waiting for oh, years, upon years upon years upon years upon years upon years upon years by the pool. Oh, yeah, I want that. And then all of a sudden, Jesus goes to Peter's like, hey, come with me. We got something to do. We're going to go into town. And they're walking into town. And, you know, they're, you know Peter's just being Peter. Hey, you know, da 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 What about this? And Jesus is like, okay, yeah, we, we, you know, we're just, we got some place to go. He starts walking towards the pool. Peter's like, what do we do? And Peter goes, this is one of those moments, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> and then Jesus walks over to the man. It's one of them. I mean, I, I couldn't help but weep. They did a fantastic job of storytelling. It was a, it was incredible. So yeah. you gotta, if you haven't seen it, you got to check it I out. I will go check it out, man. Yeah. This is, and, and there you are. Like this is right now. Mm-hmm. We read the stories in other people's books from 50 years ago, from 100 mm-hmm. years ago, from millennia ago about heroes and the things they did in the small moments uh man this is this is <laughs> this is one of those moments yeah this is actually one of those moments yeah this isn't a moment don't wait for the next season this is actually one of those moments when mm-hmm. we walk alongside jesus and we like and we get to decide do i actually believe the things that i'm telling people i believe mm-hmm up till this point this is mm-hmm. actually one of those moments yep. that they will tell stories about i'm not joking right now they mm-hmm. will tell stories about 150 years from now mm-hmm. when they talk about why does the church look like the church why does the church look the way it does now 150 yeah. years from now when they're having those conversations they will be talking about the decisions that you and i make now yeah. right now yeah they'll be talking about that then this come is on. one of those come on yeah, I I, don't, I know I kept you a little bit past the time, but I was having such a good time I'm with good. the conversation, man. I, I, you know, I wanted to I wanted to have people get a sense of your heart, um, so they understood where you were coming from because I think it's going to resonate with a lot of our listeners and video and video folks or watchers. Good. And uh, so, where can everybody find the book and find out more about you specifically? So, my two favorite places, if you go to heartsandmindsbooks.com, my 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 good friend Byron Borger is a bookseller in Dallas Town, Pennsylvania. And he's my favorite bookseller in the country. He loves the Lord, loves people, loves books. He's my favorite. So cool. if you want to, if you're one of those folks that's like, where do I book, where do I buy books so that it matters, matters, mm-hmm. then go to heartsandmindsbooks.com and and order a book from Byron. Other than that, like Amazon's got it. Barnes and Noble's got it. Your local bookstore has got it. It's it's it'll be kind of everywhere because Harper Collins is fantastic. W Publishing is a beautiful, wonderful group of, work, of book people. So mm-hmm. it'll be everywhere, uh, June first. Rock on, dude. Rock on. Well, man, I appreciate okay. you hanging out with me. Man, I had a blast. We'll definitely have to do this again for sure. I'm in, man. You hit me up. All right, dude. Take care. See ya. Bye. Hey guys, I hope you enjoyed that conversation. And if you did, I know you're gonna love this one right here. So check it out. At the end of the day. 
whether we are moving or staying stagnant, we're giving ourselves permission to either stay stuck or to evolve. That's right. But there is permission being That's given right. in some capacity. 